And next we have our presentation on the feasibility study. Uh, Mr. Gallahue. Thank you, Madam Chairman and the members of the board. Um, I'm joined here by Mr. Scott Leopold uh, with uh, our consulting company, De Young Richter. I'm going to start out with his presentation just because we were running a little late this evening. Hello, it's nice to be here. Um, I'm Scott Leopold, with Scott Leopold with Young Richter. Uh, we are a national educational planning firm based in uh, actually Hilliard, Ohio now. We just moved. Uh, I personally have been doing this uh, for about 10 years now. Uh, my background is GIS and demographic student data, that kind of stuff, and I've been doing that exclusively for the last 10 years. Um, this process, our, our kind of goal here was to provide a third-party review of existing planning processes within HCPSS. Uh, specifically tonight, we'll be talking about enrollment projections, and then we'll be kind of giving a brief update on where we are with the other pieces, such as capacity, redistricting process, adjustments to the feeder system, looking at income disparity among schools. And uh, as part of this, we've compared uh, HCPSS practices with, with uh, other districts in the state of Maryland, and uh, we've also done some blind studies to kind of see where they line up against other uh, data sources. <coughs> With our own projections, we, uh, we compared the uh, Maryland Department of uh, Planning projections to the existing projections that uh, Joel's department does. We conducted a blind study using a, create, a straight cohort mathematical model for the projections, and we analyzed the, uh, the process for using uh, the birth data as is currently used in the, in the system. With the current methodology that uh, the district uses, Data incorporated would include historical enrollment, so that's going to be uh, student enrollment by school, by grade, by year historically. Um, birth data, which is available um, in September from the, the uh, Maryland Department of uh, Mental Health, or Mental Hygiene, I'm sorry. Uh, housing transaction data, which is available in January, and that sometimes does cause a problem with uh, the timeline of the projections. And uh, that transaction data, some of the things that we look at are housing starts, single family uh, sales, and apartment transactions. And we also look at uh, interdistrict transfers, and those are something that are placed onto the projections after the geographical area projections are done. So we compared the 2010-11 school year projections with the actual data for subsequent years. So we looked at, all right, well, what did we project in 2010, and how did that com to compare to what actually happened in 2011, 12, 13, and 14? And uh, what we found was that uh, overall, uh, the accuracy is very good. And I think you can kind of see up here, I, I think you guys have gotten uh, I don't think we can see anything. <laughs> uh, we can zoom sure. in on our What page is that in our report here? Hold on just a second. Does anybody know? Just hit the. Because, oh, they, they're looking at their iPads. Okay. Yeah. Uh, page seven. They're seeing it on an iPad. Okay. We can see. All right. Thank you. So this is the actual uh, data at the district-wide level. Uh, upon the completion of the final report, we'll have all this information broken down by school. But on the left side of the of the screen, you can see that we'll have the uh, this is the actual HCPS or HCP HCPSS. I just worked in Harford County, so I apologize. Yes. <laughs> and uh, you can see this is the actual data as as it occurred. The data in the red columns are the is the projected data. And the date from HCPSS, and then the purple data is the state data. And I've got a little apple up here in the corner, and I'll come back to that in a minute because we have two different sets of data that we'll be looking at, two different comparisons, and this is the apple and the other one's the orange. And so they're a little different. But this shows you um, overall that we have a, an accuracy that is, you know, compared to the industry standards and benchmarks, very accurate overall. It's more accurate than what the state projects. Uh, if you look at the overall K-12 uh, enrollment at the bottom, the accuracy is 0.05% error 
for the first year out, and then 0.11%, 0.53, and 0.69. And one thing to remember about projections is that they're kind of similar. It's, it's a pretty good analogy to a, tracking a hurricane, is that every, every day you have a hurricane out there in the Atlantic, you get more data. And the track of that hurricane kind of has a probability. You know, it's got an X percentage of striking in this area and X percentage of striking in this area. And as that data moves, as that hurricane moves forward in time, that data that it collects, the water temperature, all those other factors that come into it have an impact on the track of that storm. And the same thing is true with enrollment projections. And so it's not uncommon for enrollment projections to be different from year to year. You're not going to necessarily have a projection that starts in 2010 and then have the same numbers that go. You're going to have new data that comes in, birth data, housing starts, and student enrollment that are going to impact that projection. And so one thing that's important to remember is that those, those numbers do consistently increase in error as we move forward in time. And so this is the, uh, this is the comparison for the 2013-14 projection with the 2014-15 actual. And uh, I believe in this projection, the district was 0.884% off at the district-wide level. And compared to the state, the state was 0.26. Now, as far as the benchmarking goes, we compared Actually, we didn't compare it. The state did this for us. They compared the projections that all these districts provided. We had 17 different districts in Maryland provide the projections to the state, which they put in this sample. And the names have been redacted to protect the innocent. This is something that the state did for us. And so we don't know exactly who these districts are, but we do know that they're in Maryland. And if you look at the, the average absolute error for one year out, we're 0.9% and then 1.5%. 2.7%, 3.5%, and 4.7%. And so that's for those other 17 districts. And if we look at Howard County, we're 0.3, 1.1, 1.0, 1.6, and 2.1. And so they are very accurate when compared to those other districts. For the blind study, what we did here is uh, we used a straight mathematical cohort model for this. Uh, the process that the district uses is a little bit more complex. It takes into account those housing starts and uh, those tra that transaction data that we alluded to earlier. This methodology for the blind study did not have any of that directly included. It was strictly based on historical enrollment and the th three-year average and five-year average survival ratios. And Joel will talk about the survival ratios a little bit more in his presentation, but what a survival ratio is, it is the percentage of students that show up in the next grade compared to the last. So if you have you know, 100 kindergartners and then the next year you have 105 first graders, that's 105% survival ratio. And so we calculate those ratios historically to come up with an average to use for a projection ratio. So in this blind study, we did two different methods. The first one used a three-year average, and the second one used a five-year average. Overall, when we compare it to this, uh, this, this methodology, the current district methodology is much more accurate. The one difference is the amount of time that goes into creating the projection. We estimate that, I think, what was it, about 250 man hours go into the, uh, the current methodology. And this straight model, which we just plug the data in, took about 10% of that time. So you can see the accuracy here on this chart. This is page or slide number 11. Again, we have the uh, actual data in the black columns, the district projection in the red, and then we have the three-year average benchmark data in the green, and then the five-year average in the, in the uh, yellow or orange. And you can see if we look across the board, we're the district is currently 0.2%, 0.2%, 0.4%, 0.9%, and then when we compare it to the other samples, we're 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 1.3. And so you can see that we have a much more high level of accuracy with the current district data when compared to that blind study. And again, this is the, uh, this is the same data for the 2013-14 projection compared to the 14-15 actual. And so again, in this case, they were pretty close, but at the school level, we'll get to, we'll get to that in the final report, the HCP, the, uh, the district projections were more accurate. Uh, we were asked to look at the birth data. Um, 
Maryland's a little lucky that they have a health department that's willing to provide them with more granular birth data than most uh, states are. They actually will provide um, point level data, and this is kind of interesting based on the conversation that you guys are having earlier about the the student information. Uh, one of the issues with this is that this data does not have any real identifying information to it at all. All that is supplied to the district is is, is a date of birth and a X and Y. When I say X and Y, that's a latitude and longitude. So there's no address associated with it or anything. And part of the issue with that is that there's really no way to ensure the accuracy of that data. And so what we did is we, we took that geocoded data, and so you can see these, these points here, and again, this is on uh, slide 14, is we have three points that are geocoded very close to a boundary line, and this has an impact, you know, if they're on that line, they're in one school or the other, a point cannot be on the line. And so when we look at this, we have three points, two of which are coded to one school and one of, and one of which is coded to the other. But we don't have any way of assuring that they're in the correct boundary. But what we did look at is we took it, we took all those points and we determined how far they were from the uh, from the line, and we determined that 95% of those points are are far enough away to be be considered accurate. But there is that little bit of concern, and as part of the recommendation, um, we would ask the state to provide their geocoding methodology or perhaps the address data so that we can verify the accuracy of it. But overall, using this data in its current form is going to be more accurate than using a countywide birth data projection because when you have just one set of numbers for the projections, you're going to have basically an upward trend or a downward trend that you're going to be applying to every school, whereas when you have the data in this form, you can do projections by different geographies and have those localized higher resolution data points. Uh, we were also asked to look at the uh, the current enrollment projection tool. Uh, it's based on on Fox Pro, which is a uh, I'm going to say the term antiquated, but it's a it's an older uh, it's an older programming language developed by Microsoft. It's no longer supported. It was developed by a a, a former retired employee, and uh, one day support for it on Windows XP is going to end. And so it's important that. We have a we can take the good things out of this software and put it into something that is you know uh, will have more momentum to go into the future. One other issue with it is that it does not does not currently have any kind of error reporting. I mean, based on the accuracy, you can see that it does produce very accurate results, but there's no error log that comes out if the input data is wrong. You have to look at the output and make sure that it looks right to ensure that it was correct going in. And so our overall recommendations uh, would be to, of course, update the enrollment projection software. And uh, we think that it would be a, uh, a good feature to install if you were able to release a preliminary projection earlier in the school year based on less data. Because we're, we're able to show that if you just, if you just look at the, the birth data and the historical enrollment data without the housing data, mm -hmm. they are still reasonably accurate for budgetary purposes and that kind of thing. We do need to have that housing component, however, for the redistricting processes because we need to you know, basically show your work. And having that ability to have a preliminary projection could be useful in the budgetary process. And, uh, and it would also help with reporting because we could, we could have that preliminary number and then have that final data later in the year taking in all that housing data into account. Our next steps in this process will be completing the rest of the summers. We're looking at uh, capacity. I, I do understand that you already had uh, another group look at the capacity, so it should be up to date, but we just kind of wanted to share some of the observations that we've seen other districts do throughout the country. Uh, just one quick little anecdote I wanted to share is that I had a, a school that we had recently programmed in Montgomery, Alabama that was a 1,400 student station school, and the District calls us a couple years later after it's been open saying, hey, we need an addition and we only have 1,200 kids in there. And so we went into the facility and we took the, uh, we took the master schedule and we compared it to the floor plan. And we were able to see that we designed this school with planning spaces for teachers, but they were not using them. They were living in their classrooms essentially. And so we had, you know, we were able to show visually by joining that master schedule data to the floor plan, areas that could be reclaimed capacity. And so it was kind of non-capital ways to better utilize the existing schools. And so that's something that we're going to look at kind of at a, at a sample level. The way that the planning department has your data now, it would be very easily to do that kind of study. 
Uh, redistricting process, uh, this is something that I have a, a lot of experience with and heartburn over the years. I'm sure that everybody loves redistricting. But uh, we're, we're going to share some of our uh, observations uh, throughout the country and uh, compare the processes. And, uh, and one of the things we were asked to do is, is compare how accurate the, the projections are for the, bound, the enrollment of those boundaries after redistricting compared to the actual. And I, I know one thing that's important to consider is that through the act of redistricting, that has in itself an impact on enrollment. Because you can redistrict a, a student, and then based on that action, they may choose to go to a different school or move. And so that's something that needs to be considered when we look at that kind of comparison. Uh, another question was, you know, well, we're using these polygon methods or planning units. I think that you guys do call them polygons here, <laughs> planning polygons. Unfortunately, if you want to be able to quickly analyze data and see, you know, farm percentages, utilization, that kind of thing, it's the best way to do it. Not sure if that's what you guys wanted to hear, but that it, from a from a statistical standpoint, it's it's, it's very robust. And you can see here, these are the, the planning polys for Howard County. We have 701 polygons. Uh, this averages 70 students per polygon. And uh, do you know how long have you how long has, has this process been in place? About. 10 years? Yeah, about 10 years. It did have a lower number of polygons. And, you know, as, as time moves forward, these things tend to get cut up and into smaller chunks. This is a Fort Bend Independent School District. This is a, a district that I just did a district-wide feeder pattern alignment for last school year. And they use the same uh, planning polygon process. They have about, they have about 20,000 students more than you guys. They have 268 planning polygons, and uh, they just started this. So as time moves on and they grow, I'm sure they'll have more polygons. But uh, what, what you can see with, with this data is they have much larger average students per polygon. They have, in some cases, over 1,000, but their average is about 270 students per polygon. And so it is possible you know, to maybe look at some of these, and if we have in here areas that that you know, students would always walk. You know, we have a very dense areas of polygons in here. If we have a cluster of those that can be consolidated to make it a little simpler, it may help the process out a little bit. Uh, we've also been act, asked to look at the uh, the feeder system um, in Fort Bend. This is a this is a, a system where we had a master planning process two years ago, and part of the community recommendation out of that was to do a feeder pattern alignment process because they had they had elementary schools that were splitting off to six different middle schools and then back into one high school or two high schools and it just wasn't a desirable situation for the students and so last fall we had a process where we we had a, a total of probably 12 different kind of community forums and a lot of blood sweat and tears but we ended up taking them from they had they have the pretty much the exact same number of schools you guys have they're actually opening up elementary 46 next year so they're pretty close and uh, of their 45 elementary schools I think they had about six that were perfect feeders and after this process they have about 35 of them that are going to feed perfectly into a middle school so part of what we were asked to look at was determine the scope of redistricting that would be required to do something like that and so that's kind of what our next step is uh, I'm sorry. One more piece. Our last piece was to kind of look at the uh, look at the income disparity among schools, and uh, this is this is something that um, may be a little challenging because uh, we have what's the ma the maximum I believe is about 20 20 percent farm for Trinity schools down to zero, and uh, by nature a lot of these areas are going to be 20 percent. Is that is that our um, no, we have more than that in some of our schools. We have sometimes the total population in the district is about twenty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what I, I'm sorry. That's, that's correct. Um, what we did here, I mean, again, I'm going to compare back to Fort Bend. They had areas of the district that were, you know, bordering on Houston that were 80, 90, 100 percent farm schools. And part of what we looked at was, can we can we distribute those students elsewhere in the district without a forced busing scenario and in that situation we determined that it just wasn't feasible and so that's something that we'll be looking at to see what 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 would be required to have something like that happen to just to have a you know bring those schools that are kind of at the opposite ends of the bell curves into the middle so at this point i'm happy to entertain any questions you guys have thank you very much 
Um, I think, uh, well, I guess. Get somebody else's. Mr. Lacey, you want to go ahead? Yes, thank you very much for um, this work. So you're, when will you finish? I think, when are we scheduled for? Um, the, I think the, the, we don't have it scheduled for a report to the board mm -hmm. yet, so it's a, just a matter of the timing that you guys. And before yeah. school starts, for sure. Oh, before school starts. Yes. So um, the other thing was that when you looked at the comparisons in Maryland, that was sort of an average of all the school systems. My assumption is, and how we compared, Mm -hmm. Right. So were there any school systems that really their numbers were even more accurate than ours? Or were um, Howard County Public Schools the best, um, had the be did they have the best accuracy of all? Um, we, we didn't get that level of data from the state. What they did give us is what we have up here. And you can see that the, the, the average uh, absolute error for, for one year out was 0.9%. The standard deviation was 0.6%. And then Howard County was at 0.3. And so they're at the bottom of that standard deviation. So to give you a rough estimate, I, they're at the top as far as that. You're at the top as far as accuracy. I can't tell you for sure if you're the best. Because that would be helpful if we actually knew um, if, you know, who was. We can, Without knowing the actual school systems, school systems, because I understand how you don't want to, uh, you know, uh, present that data. But it wouldn't be helpful for me personally to know how we rank within the state. We can certainly ask them to give us the ranking, if okay. that would help. We can certainly ask. And so would, have you worked with any school systems, and then this is my last one, when you looked at actual, I mean, we're kind of, when we looked at um, without forced busing or things are, you know, um, that nature, have you actually had any experience in ensuring that there's less disparity as far as um, you know large numbers of uh, students who are farms eligible versus those who have no farm students? Absolutely, our firm actually uh, we're we're currently kind of doing a tour of the state of Alabama <laughs> with oh, wow. a unitary status process. We just worked uh, with Huntsville City Schools on their consent decree, and so that's. That's really a lot of what we've done the last couple of years, getting into that kind of deal. But actually, the, the other piece of working with the Department of Justice to ensure that we're following all that process correctly. And that would be very helpful. Sure. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Bellencourt. Hi. When you the high resolution local data. Sure. Um, if, if am I correct that it's you're talking about over the. Over the whole county, we have a 0.5 percent. Correct. But if you, at some point, you can see where, in, in a specific school, whether the whether our projections are accurate for a specific school. We can look at it uh, for at this point in the study. We kind of looked at it just at the at the high level to see if it was really that big of an issue, and then we compared that data to using just the countywide data instead of using individual birth counts for each school, we just use the countywide, and we determined that even with the data the way it is, it's more accurate, so we kind of stopped. But I'm it, sorry, it, I'm not following you. Even with the data the way it is, it's more so, accurate? So what this data, so it's in, point, it's in a point data format, so we have a, an actual point on a map for each birth that has occurred historically. And what... She's talking about the enrollment projection. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I'll, I'm, I'll, I'll circle this around. <laughs> and so... That data is then counted by elementary boundary, and then we get a birth count by boundary based on that data. And that data, we have a birth number for each elementary school, and then we have a observed kindergarten. And so we calculate that survival ratio that we're talking about based on birth to kindergarten, and so we get that number. And when we look at using those individual elementary grade numbers versus a countywide birth number, our standard deviations versus actual were better using that data in the current format that it is, even if it does have that that possible 5% error. Does that make sense, or am I? Well, yeah. I mean, if you're saying that we our, our anecdotal experience is that some schools have had their, have had very widely varying degrees of accuracy in anticipating mm -hmm. the student count when even including them, 
all across the county were really close. Sure. But if if that's just sort of our perception and isn't actually what is happening, that's important information to have. When we have the the final report, we'll have appendices that have this information for every single school, and I think what we'll be able to do is look and see well which which schools have the most volatile birth to kindergarten ratios and we can point those out and figure out where those are but there's other factors that would go into kindergarten than just birth i mean kids kids aren't necessarily always born mm -hmm. in that attendance area so there could be transiency uh, transfers from other schools other things that would impact it but that's certainly something that we can look at and then the other thing is in the district you were you, you were talking about that went from six perfect feeder elementaries to 35 yeah would, would you call that a mature um, community where there's not going to be a lot of growth in some part of their community that will make it not survive very long um, they are they are a fast-growing district so how long do you think that how long would you expect that you, the new feeder pattern would 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 survive they that that particular district wrote a policy uh, specifically for this and it the way it's written, they review it every year, and they ensure that it stays intact based on policy. And so that's that's part of the way that they're ensuring it. It's it's not a static point in time because because of all that growth, they're they're building new schools all the time. And when they do that, part of that policy guideline is to ensure that they keep those feeder patterns in place. So the feeder pattern can stay intact, but you'd still be redistricting. Correct. Okay. Well, when you're redistricting, one of those guidelines for those boundaries is, does it maintain a clean feeder system? You know, does it ensure diversity? That's, that's the way they kind of have it written. And I can absolutely share that policy with you if you'd like to see it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Great. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Too late to get your flight back to Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so Good much. Good luck. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yes. We roll. Thank you, Madam Chairman and the members of the board. Um, I'm going to go right into the presentation in the interest of time. The printed cover of the feasibility study has been updated um, to show the elements of planning that come into play, capacity, enrollment trends. Um, you can see this graphic on the cover of your document. And this, uh, the darker areas indicate more intense rate of change projected. It's, it happens to be based upon elementary growth. But I thought it was kind of interesting because it helps to show some of the areas is that um, that we see for uh, growth like the um, Route 1 corridor uh, the uh, in the east um, Fulton area the town center and uh, Ellicott City with Turf Valley so just a, just a kind of a quick visual to give you a sense as to where the growth is coming um, I'd also, uh, you know, in the team that's worked on this, I just want to give acknowledgement and also not shown, but I'd like to acknowledge Bev Davis and the budget and finance team for coordinating on the long range plan. Um, the feasibility study is the primary driver of capital planning, uh, as well as redistricting, attendance area adjustment. It's here to give the board a first look. Um, this is, uh, we use this report to uh, review CIP options gain direction on redistricting plans. Finally, uh, we use this report to make plain on an annual basis the overall multi-year strategy that staff is considering. Um, this chart here uh, helps the show how the feasibility study relates to the two processes, the capital budget, which is annual, and redistricting, which happens less frequently. Um, at the top, you can see that the, uh, we're at the enrollment projections uh, coming into the feasibility stage. We are not doing redistricting this year, but if we were going into that process, we would go on with the process on the right. Um, as it stands, we're going to be going through into the capital budget very shortly. Um, so uh, part of what we're looking at in this is the potential changes to the FY17 capital budget. In the end of the entire cycle, we come up with an open and closed chart, which you guys just had an opportunity to review, which is up at the Council for a decision at this time. And the process for adequate public facilities is also being reviewed at this time. Mm -hmm. 
Um, enrollment projections are really the underpinning for the capital, uh, for the planning and the feasibility study. Um, it occupies our office in the winter time. We collect data from state and local agencies, as Mr. Leopold had mentioned. We use our GIS to map the data and ensure that we gain local school level insights um, about the various trends. Um, this graphic that I'm going to show is gets to what um, Scott was mentioning earlier, the uh, cohort. Um, so the yellow area is uh, showing an actual cohort of students progressing through the school system. So they show up in the first year as 77 kindergartners, but in the second year there's 93 first graders, and the following year there's 107 second graders. Uh, just to give you a little taste of the math that goes into the projection, it's not particularly difficult. It's just uh, the, the, the newest year divided by the previous year to give a ratio. We collect up those ratios over history, and we begin to use those to make projections about um, what, what the school will uh, have in its uh, change from first to second grade or second to third grade. So the straight cohort models that Mr. Leopold mentioned in his, his uh, work would have been just taking the three-year average of this type of math or the five-year average of this type of math. And what he was alluding to is that in our office, we leaven that with additional data like housing uh, and so forth, which helps to get us that additional accuracy. Um, we're also really committed to con continuous improvement with this process. That's a big part of why we had the consultant working with us. Um, we share our results with the board at each February with the accuracy report and uh, the county -wide level uh, error rate and the level error rates at the elementary, middle, and high were no higher than a half, one half, um, half of one percent. Eighty-five percent of the schools were within five percent accuracy, and a quarter of them were within ten students of the actual. Um, turning to those trends in this uh, in this graphic, the yellow line represents the new projection that's presented with this document, the 2015 projection. For reference, we've also included two previous years. Um, this projection showing a more modest rate of enrollment growth than last year's at the elementary level, um, but it is continuing to grow. It becomes stronger after 2021. We're growing and we will increase by approximately 4,500 students by 2024 at the elementary level. Um, the capacity utilization of the elementary schools will, as a group, the whole, the whole of them will exceed 110% by 2021. But the projects approved as a part of the FY16 CIP are um, very much necessary and can help absorb most of this growth. The trend for the 2015 projection at the middle school level um, is uh, also um, lower than last year's, um, but we will increase by about 2,500 students by 2024. Um, the capacity utilization of all the middle schools combined will exceed a begin to exceed 110% by 2024. Um, like the elementary schools, I didn't mention, but most of this growth is in the east, particularly the northeast. And um, the, the projects approved, meaning Thomas Viaduct, can only partially absorb this growth. One of the things we've been we're talking about is the uh, capital project for expanding Ellicott Mills uh, Middle School, is uh, whether we'll be able to hang on to that in the, t in the schedule where it is. Um, the trend for the high school enrollment is to increase by 4,000 students approximately by 2024. Uh, capacity utilization of all the high schools combined will begin to exceed 110% by 2020. Um, Long-term growth trends certainly indicate that land should be banked for future high school needs in the eastern part of the county and program changes may be considered. Um, this document includes a figure which shows the, how the long-range plan is evolving, and I'd like to take a few minutes to break that down. Um, the first thing is the projects that are already fully funded and well underway. Laurel Woods Elementary School Edition, this graphic is from March of this year. You can see the uh, two-story addition um, in this uh, uh, this graphic down at the bottom. The other one that's uh, going to continue on through the next year is the deep run addition. So here we have a northeastern elementary school and a southeastern elementary school bringing capacity where we need it. So we, this is the kind of uh, planning that we have been doing, and we'd like to be able to continue it. Um, one of them is the Wild Lake Middle School replacement. Um, this. 
project, um, and just a quick note on this chart, the bold indicates where the uh, seats have changed or there's some kind of change in the capacity. The blue uh, box and arrow indicates a shift uh, in the timeline as to when we believe the school will go based upon, or the additional go based upon the, the recently approved FY16 capital budget. And then the, the, the t uh, gray um, fill is showing those years that are part of the 2017 budget's um, long range plan. So while Lake um, Middle School was one of them that we managed to retain in the capital budget, one of the other ones that is still in the capital budget but it's delayed a year is Waverly Elementary School, 100 seats. That's very important to the northern region um, in terms of our dealing with growth in that area. Um, Dunlogging is a systemic that's in the capital budget, so we move moving Waverly to 2018. Um, that's a systemic project that does have some capacity associated, but it, we we also see that being moved in this recently approved capital budget. Swansfield was probably one of the more important discussions as part of this recent capital budget, as you may know that this is a uh, capacity that can help us in the interim in the Columbia West region. We won't get that new school for some time to come, but we do have this addition. It looks like it's funded, so we can move forward um, with, a, with planning for some redistricting within the region to take advantage of that capacity. Um, so let's just uh, do a little bit of... Uh, uh, cleaning up here, we also are going to need to move the elementary school back to 2018 and change the capacity to 788 seats, as was decided. We don't have any capital projects in 2020 that would add capacity to the system. That's amazing. And looking forward, we've got the, uh, the, the balance of the years. The, this last capital budget was innovative in that it looked at a number of projects out further into the future that we had not yet discussed in capital budgets. We uh, had some reference to them in the feasibility study, but it was not as clear. So I'm showing these projects in the years that they're in the capital budget. I just put back those other changes um, to just for clarity. But these other projects are not, I don't believe they're going to stay exactly where they're shown as we continue, because my understanding is that there's constraints um, as we look forward on the capital budget. but. On the other hand, from a planning perspective, it's really important to know where we're headed. So maybe the project isn't 2023 for elementary school 43. Maybe it's maybe it's a later year, but at least we have a sense as to where we're headed with these projects and we can make plans. And if we have another option that can save us some resources and delay one of these projects, that's another that's a test in terms of looking at options that are ahead of us. So um, the document goes through each region at each level, uh, elementary, middle, and high school. But here tonight, we're going to make some groupings. We have um, three eastern regions, the northeastern, the southeastern, and the Columbia East. Most elementary enrollment growth is in the northeastern region, as is the case with the th other levels. So accelerating elementary school, elementary school 42 was very important. The change to 788 seat model, also very important. The schools in the southeast region, with the exception of Forest Ridge, are projected below 110% utilization at the start of the coming school year. But growth is coming. We know this. We've added temporary capacity. Um, and so we'll uh, continue to monitor if that elementary school 43 is delayed. Maybe we look at other program changes to free up space. Um, capacity of the third of those regions in the East Columbia East region will remain. So what we're looking at in the pictures, just for reference, the top picture, Thomas Viaduct Middle School is in the background, and that's the stair tower for a multifamily building that's going up in Oxford Square. And below that is uh, part of the Howard Square community, um, which also feeds um, the, the same middle school and elementary school. Um, the, and then this next graphic, I'm showing a picture of uh, Swansfield and just a, a schematic of the Running Brook edition because um, I wanted to give you a sense as to where we're headed. But the Columbia School Plan, you might remember, was attached to the 2014 feasibility study, and that identified Faulkner Ridge as the site for the next school in the region. Um, the next redistricting will likely be among existing schools, and it'll take advantage of something like what we did at Running Brook, 
um, but but to Swansfield. So it'll just you know if you think about it geographically, you've got Running Brook, uh, is more a little bit more to the east, and then you've got Bryant Woods and then Swansfield. So to be some kind of redistricting among those schools to take advantage of that new capacity. It looks like it would be about 450 students, and it would be consistent with the long-term redistricting plan for opening the new school at Faulkner Ridge, um, possibly in 2028 if we're lucky. So it would, you know, something that we might consider adding to the redistricting in 2017 uh, wouldn't be directly related to the opening of elementary school 42, but it would take advantage of this capacity that we're building at Swansfield. Um, the other thing, other regions that are, seem to make sense co to combine are the northern and western regions because of the crowding at Manor Woods. Um, the western region can give us some additional flexibility. Um, we know just from having been through the capital budget, Waverly was delayed and we're facing these other constraints in capital funding, so West Friendship and Bushy Park capacity may provide some options. Um, we have modeled some redistricting, um, which could be done with the opening of elementary school 42, just timing-wise, not that it would be related. Um, but that uh, redistricting would be approximately 800 students. I still wouldn't recommend that we pull away from someday obtaining another school site like in Turf Valley um, for long-term needs, but we could take advantage of that existing capacity if we're willing to um, work with the transportation uh, uh, and, 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 and at least use what we have. Um, the other thing that this document considers is middle school redistricting associated with the elementary redistricting to align the feeds. Um, we don't normally do that. We usually redistrict at the one level. But we learned when we did this, the elementary redistricting in the southeast region last, um, which is, I believe, 2011, there were some changes that would have been fairly small at the middle school level, but they would have lined up the feeds. So we don't want to miss out on those opportunities. Um, so advertising for potential middle school redistricting ahead of time so that there isn't any surprise in the discussion seems to be a good idea. Um, and then I also am showing Ellicott Mills. The first picture shows um, Thomas Viaduct, but Ellicott Mills. And because that of the um, additional constraints on the capital budget, the addition to Ellicott Mills could be delayed. So there might be some feasible redistricting that we could take advantage of in the northern region um, that would help to relieve that, that crowding. And we still believe it's important to acquire land for a future middle school. Um, despite any any delays that we're seeing in capital funding, uh, the high school consideration. I think you know if, if you're going to talk about crowding in high schools, it's important to have a picture of Howard High School. Um, it, we're going to continue to evaluate the long range plan, but we the biggest decision we made in a while about this situation was putting the nine classroom um, portable building at Howard to take give some uh, relief there. Um, we could consider program adjustments to balance capacity. There is some feasible redistricting, but it's not something that's going to be a, a fix for, for forever. So acquiring a site in the land bank for a high school, looking at other program adjustments are definitely recommended as we go forward. So in summary, uh, the primary recommendation of this plan is monitoring conditions and preparing for a redistricting process that would be in 2017, uh, that would take effect in 2018. Uh, for, this was first suggested in the 2013 feasibility study. Um, we, do, uh, we also think that this redistricting um, should consider using some capacity in the western region um, and possibly redistricting within the Columbia West region. And finally, we believe multi-level redistricting, particularly including the middle school redistricting along with the elementary, would allow us to get better feeds in, in the decisions. So um, it it brings more people, obviously, to the meetings. It kind of changes the discussion a little, but um, it does allow us to make decisions like Mr. Leopold was talking about in terms of uh, lining up the feeds of the schools. Um, let me just, just a couple of quick things. Uh, uh, August 13, the, the pre-development public hearing on FY17 capital budget is scheduled. That's a, not a report meeting. That's a, just an initial input from the community. Uh, September 3rd is the presentation of the capital budget. And um, 
The redistricting timeline in 17 would basically span from the moment I'm standing here um, in 2017 to about the middle of November. Just to give you a rough idea, that's the redistricting uh, schedule um, from previous years just carried forward. So at this point, I'd be happy to answer any questions or comments uh, that you might have. Well, I'll just answer the questions. I won't answer any comments. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned not to. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Gallahue. Mrs. Valencourt, did you have your card up? Oh, no, sorry. It's just still there. Uh, Mrs. French? I could say a lot, but I've just got to say that my personal opinion is, is that to do a entire county-wide redistricting in one year is insanity for board members. I really believe it needs to be phased in, and we choose the um, the lesser press, pressing areas first, and then do the big elementary school. If you're going to combine the middle schools with them, we just can't concentrate on an entire county. It's not our level of expertise. We don't live with it like you do every day at work. And so I would suggest that we look at the western and northern regions, perhaps, and deal with those first, or whatever you would recommend. But personally, I need a two-year phase in on all of these suggestions. Um, and I've just got to say that um, I don't know about this current county council, but it, there were times when the county council would tell us point blank, we are not going to approve any more capital facilities until you use the seats you have available and justify why those seats are not being used. And for example, at West Friendship, as you pointed out, there are definitely excellent seats available. And they are below our policy level of appropriate programming. And I still think that we owe that community um, either, you know, if the worry is about the septic, then I would like to see you bring us in the next capital budget uh, a plan for dealing with the septic there so that we can then use the 200 plus seats that are available at West Friendship. Ms. French, we have um, effective Ju July 1 are going to do a feasibility study of the septic at West Friendship. Thank you. The, the community loves that school. They are not advocating for a bells and whistles brand new building. Um, they would like to celebrate their 90th birthday and get to their 100th. And, uh, it, we believe that the kids there are getting an excellent program. They have excellent uh, teachers. So we should, they're only two miles down the road from Manor Woods. You know, Manor Woods can be relieved right now, in my opinion. So there, I've said it. Um, no questions. <laughs> Ms. Lacey. Yes, um, Joel, I didn't hear anything about, I mean, I read through all of this, I listened closely to the discussion, and I don't believe I heard anything about an all-county redistricting. Was that stated someplace? Um, I didn't use those words. I mean, there's a, uh, a number of different components of redistricting discussed. Right, so before. I didn't hear that. Right. So what I'm saying to you is I was looking at your suggestion in the West, and um, and I'm just looking in the book, and I made a lot of little notes. I said, um, it said, um, West Friendship, yes, but needs Northern Region limited capital funds. Uh, Fulton, Pointers Run, blah, blah, blah. And I'm looking at page 23 of the um, booklet that, that you gave us, which, by the way, this is very well done. It is. Um, and I just want to say that I'm looking at Bushy Park, which is 75, uh, 77.5, Clarksville, 76.3, Dayton Oaks, 76.4, um, Fulton, uh, 95.9, Lisbon, 77.8, Pointers Run, 97.0, Tridelphia Ridge, uh, 90.0, West Friendship, 67.1.
where would you, where are you going to get the kids to redistrict, and where, where are you going to redistrict? I, I know I read some of that, but and I went back and read your scenarios for redistricting. Um, that's just one of the questions. How are you going to redistrict the kids so that you can fill up that space? But Because in looking at the um, consultant that came in, there were a number of things. He talked about land preservation, land use, where building is, the economics of a particular area. Yes. So where, if you, what, how are you going to do that? What um, we would do is we'd use the western region to relieve the northern region because so Manor Woods uh, is in the northern region, but it's very close to this, this to this uh, western region. And isn't it the only school that is sort of bursting at the seams? Yeah. Because you're not going to. It's fill. one of the only. One. Yeah, it's the one the one with the strongest growth for sure because what's feeding it is Turf Valley. Right, but what I'm saying to you is you've got all of these schools that are under-enrolled, and so when we talked about it before, about moving some of the, ki of the kids to very densely populated ones, or you even talked about the domino effect, I mean, how are you going to do that? I just don't, I don't see it, because Manor Woods is one place, but you've got all these other schools that are under-enrolled. Well, it's a you know this is a conceptual discussion at, in the, in this report. We're not proposing the redistricting for this year, but um, if you are looking at crowding at Manor Woods and a, uh, a limited capital funding, so that you're not going you know for you know, we've already had delay Waverly's addition, um, and you could possibly look at. Um, uh, reassigning the the parts, re, or maybe even reassigning from Turf Valley directly to one of the western schools, so that you uh, you know you could uh, take advantage of that capacity. Because some of the one of the experiences we had in the last redistricting um, that is sort of setting us up for the opening of Elementary School 42 was we took a, an area out of Deep Run and assigned it to Rockburn. It was not the adjacent school, right? But it, it allows us to. Um, to kind of use that capacity in the interim until we can open up the new school. What, but would you want to build a turf valley when you've got all of those other schools not that far away who are under-enrolled? Well, it, you know, distance is, you know, I guess the distance, uh, characterization of distance varies by exactly. the person who's evaluating it. And so that's going to be a part of any redistricting discussion is the distance traveled. But um, what we're going to have to work with with our pupil transportation staff is what would the actual nature of that be? Because some bus routes require a number of stops, and a lot of your time is associated with the loading part of the, of the bus route. Other bus routes start at an area where there's a high density of students and they're full and then they go and so the time that they're on the road or the time that they're in the bus is right, travel time right, I guess so you. with some with some careful planning there might be an opportunity but it's really too early to get into specifics okay and then I'm looking at my neck of the woods which is over uh, on page 19 and 18 where you've got you know you've got running brook which is over and Swansfield I'm sorry. Who are now, you know, really um, overpopulated, and I'm looking at um, Crater Rock, Jeffers Hill, but the projections for 2020 when I'm probably dead and gone. Um, are, oh, that's not that far away, is it? Five years. Oh, yeah, let's hope not. So, anyway. Fit to be fit. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess it's not that. So, how. I, it just it just seems so far away, and it just seems as if um, things are so. It's just like in the middle schools they're crowded, at the high schools they're not, at the elementaries they're not. So how do we stagger that? What do you? Well, we start with this document. Now, this is our way of um, you know what, what's the advantage? I mean, there's a lot of work that goes into these documents. What's the advantage if we're not even talking about redistricting this year? It's it's a it's an ongoing discussion. It gives people a chance to talk about these things in concept, see the numbers, um, have some transparency, um, and then when we get to the decision, there's going to be someone that says, "Where did this come from? How did you how did you get to this idea?" Well, we can say, you know, we've been looking at this for a number of years. These ideas have been discussed. Uh, doesn't mean everyone's here for this meeting tonight, but these documents are posted on board docs. They can be reviewed. So, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Delisi. Um, Dr. Alwerger. Okay.
Okay, this may be just a really naive question, so excuse me if it is, but um, it seems to me that the way you carve up the map has, in a sense, at least a conceptual or, um, or per perceptual um, effect on how we look at things. Okay. So. Um, in terms of what, who, which schools relieve which and um, how we um, shift populations around. For example, um, when you look at the western region for elementary and the northern region, mm -hmm. um, and you consider the fact that Manor Woods is, is so close to... Um, Manor Woods is actually very close to like West Friendship and Tridelphia, but it's in another region. Right. This, how, how do you determine where these boundaries are? And if we looked at regions in a different way, couldn't we come up with other possible solutions for how to relieve some of the crowding, or how to shift population so that we're, we're using capacity? Yes. Well, so that there is an answer for that. That we are not held to keeping within the region when we do the redistricting. We're what? We're not held to staying within the re the region when we look at redistricting. But it does help us to know, for example, by grouping the schools in the region that there is capacity in the western region. In 2020, we know from looking at page 23 that it it's uh it's about. 89% uh, utilized the total region. So we know there's capacity there. But no, in this report actually does consider the same thing that you're talking about, is moving moving neighborhoods out of the northern region into a western school where the capacity is. We don't we don't look at the regions as as a, 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 a something that we can't get involved in, but feeds is another consideration. So that's why another part of this report was that we might need to look at multiple levels in redistricting to help align the feeds. If you stay within regions, you have a little bit better chance of not interrupting the feeds, but it's not perfect either way. It's just something that, that you have to look at. So I inherited these regions. They go back to yeah. uh, a ways back in time, I think, when they were doing this. Yeah, like budget. maybe we need to rethink the way we carve up the district, unless it is corresponding to something I don't know about. I mean, does it correspond to anything? I mean, it, I mean, it kind of works, I find, just in thinking about things. So, uh, you know, it, it helps me to just know which regions have capacity, but I wouldn't say it's the only way to do it. But it kind may, of may I, may shades I, that in may a I way. Just say, yeah. Aren't we required to have some kind of a regional approach because of uh, the regional council among the counties? Well, I think that for there's a regions test at the elementary level for APFO. There's a schools test. There's a regions test at the elementary level, and then there's a middle school middle schools test. That might be part of the reason why we have these regions. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, mean, I tend to test? think of them more mathematically, and then I I don't spend a ton of time. Um, beyond that, just well, we've got capacity in the western region, so why don't maybe we can consider using that? Um, that's that, and I move forward from there. I don't feel like, well, they're in the northern region, so I wouldn't redistrict them into the western region. I just know that by moving out of the northern region into the western region, we're probably going to have to look at the middle school level, too, to make sure that we balance out the seats. Yeah, it's, it just seems odd to me, like Fulton Elementary School is really far from Lisbon, and it's south. It's, it's okay, it's west-ish. But it's, yeah. it's further east than Clarksville. Well, I mean, I mean Western region yeah. is a third of the county. I mean, that's it's at least a third of the county from that map. But this is just the low density part of the county. That's why the school boundaries are so large. And um, but it's yeah, something. I mean, a lot of crossover. Something we might look at. You know, Fulton is. You're right. It's very. It's a different kind of area than. Total, say, I mean, it's yeah. It's the southern part of the this region. Is, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah, we've taken. Could, could I just point out to Ms. Altward that you did present in the feasibility study what we en ended up calling the scorched earth model. <laughs> um, it was what would happen if we just made the whole map plain and started to re 
mm -hmm. reconfigure what might be logical, and the whole county was in an absolute uproar. Really? Oh, yes, scorched earth is that, oh, is that what true definition. How many years ago was this? Uh, was seven, that 2007, seven, about I think. six or seven? It was. Yeah, we made a lot of new. Uh, we met a lot of people that year. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions from Mr. Gallagher? Um, I, I do have some questions. Oh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, and, you know, uh, one of the things as we look at, and thank you for this document, it's great. Yeah. Um, one of the things as we look at the next few years, I really think we need to look long term because I think that, um, I think we're going to need to move a middle school up in the northern region, even though, even if, if we get to the point of doing a addition at Ellicott Mills, um, I just don't see that as holding the capacity for that area. Um, also, do you really think that n elementary school number 42 is going to help the southeast region? Well, it doesn't. You know, it doesn't seem to help as much as it had in modeling in the, a couple years back. You know, but I, I think that um, given the you know, somewhat grimmer capital picture, we're going to have to look at other ways to use what we have down in that area. So we, we're too far at that point to take advantage of the western region, for example, as that earlier discussion. So that's where we might need to look at programming, but it's just too early to tell. Um, so. And Mrs. French, I, you know, I love West Friendship. I think it's a great little school, but I'm not sure the capacity there and the age of the school is really going to help us long term. And I think that we need to look at other options. And since Do we additional options, we have to look at um, the, <coughs> the air, land that we have at, at Turf Valley. Um, it's 41 acres. I know not all of it is usable, but um, you know, looking at more of like. A, something that we have at Oxford Square where we have an elementary and middle school, you know, on that property sort of, you know, long term to help out that sort of north, northwest area. Um, also, no, we've been saying this for I don't know how many years, we need high school number 13. And we really need to look at that to relieve um, the northeast corridor. And then I, I, I brought this question before and I'm going to go through a scenario regarding the AFO chart and the capacity utilization. So we've, we opened Duckett's Lane and we closed Duckett's Lane. Um, so that school is remaining closed based on our capacities um, for, for the unforeseeable future. You know, it's closed all the way up to the 2020s. Um, but for the housing development for the county, it opens up in three years. Mm -hmm. And so it's a misconception because we're looking at it as closed, yet it's open for development. And what information do you get from the county to help you in your projections when there's development going on, yet on our chart we have a closed school? Um, what they, uh, well, this is the, 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 what you're comparing is the, next, the, the open and closed chart is showing that it will be open in the three years with last year's projection and the adjusted capacity of taking the programs out of the school because we're taking out the, um, the all, all of the programs the under under kindergarten age programs that we had put in there to make that space at that school. So that's what it's looking at. It's not obviously the long term. Uh, solution. You know, we want to be able to use those spaces and, you know, in, in schools or at least have the option of it. This is showing the new projection um, and what it ha what you're asking in your question is what information did DPZ give us that's different that in last year than last year's projection? And that's the housing projection model. So each year they take the projected housing um, across the county and at each school, and they model it for us, and put it, and we bring that into the projection. So when Mr. Leopold was speaking earlier about the enrollment projection as that they did, the models they did as a straight cohort, this is the part that we use that makes ours different from that straight cohort. This is the part that gives us the sense as to what's coming forward in land development. But the problem that we have had is that the phasing of large projects can change between years. So you can start to see a school close very suddenly because of that phasing. Right. And so it's a, 
maybe through this AVVO committee we'll come up with some more innovative way to deal with this. Uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll see uh, what comes of that. Um, but it's a whenever you're partnering and sharing data and having two different organizations, there's going to be some differences in how things are done. And so I think we're always going to have a little bit of friction just because of the nature of it. And right. we'll have to muddle through. All right. Thank you. And, and thank you for the planning, um, the, you know, the planning process study. Just one more, one more question. I'm looking at Paige. Oh, by the way, we're happy to have Christine O'Connor on that committee. So I'm sure you'll bring out, and I think Ellen, um, not Ellen, but Alice is on there as well. And Patrick's Former also people who know. All right, so I'm looking at page 16. Yes, ma'am. You know, I live on Rivendell and Cedar Lane. Where in the heck is that land bank? <laughs> they don't have a sign. <laughs> yeah, but I'm right there, and it's, it's not that... We have land that's near the school. Uh, oh, over there on the yeah. path? Yeah. Okay. I'll make a map of it. And okay, and then along. I'm looking at Clary's Forest. Where's the 10 acres over there? It's next to the it's community enough. center. And the oh, pool. is it? It's, yeah, when it's sort of a semicircular shaped okay. piece of land um, with, uh, it's inhabited by trees pretty much. Okay, at the moment. thank you. <laughs> I was wondering, I'll put some question marks there. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Mr. Gallahue. Thank you. Very good. And next, uh, or last, is our um, quarterly agenda, Mrs. Hanks. Good evening. I'm presenting to you the July through September.